Winter 2023. Wearing a military uniform, President Joe Biden is marching 13,000 soldiers to quell widespread protests that have erupted. Wait. What? Well, don't worry guys, you didn't miss any bizarre event of a U.S. president leading a militia to suppress protests across the country. It's not like you live at the end of the 18th century under President George Washington. The Whiskey Rebellion prompted the president to mount his horse and lead thousands of troops to collect taxes by himself. Please like and subscribe to support the channel and let's get started. In the 1790s, the United States, fresh off its victory in the Revolutionary War, found itself in financial trouble. The young nation was swimming in debt, owing a hefty sum to European allies who had funded its fight against Great Britain. Alexander Hamilton, the Treasury Secretary, faced a tough task of balancing the books. His solution was a bit problematic. A tax on distilled spirits. Now, if you were a farmer back then, your crop wasn't just grain, it was the key ingredient in America's favorite liquid asset, whiskey. In these times, whiskey was more than just a drink. In places like Pennsylvania, it was a cornerstone of the economy, practically serving as currency. Forget gold or cash, a jug of whiskey was your ticket to trade. For farmers, whiskey was a no-brainer. It was easier to store and transport than grain, and unlike bread, it didn't spoil. You could ship it off to faraway markets or trade it locally. Whiskey wasn't just a commodity, it was your lifeline in a predominantly cash-poor economy. So, when Hamilton's tax hit the scene, it was more than a financial obstacle, it was a threat to your very way of life. This wasn't just a tax on luxury, it was a tax on your bread and butter. The response from farmers was a mix of anger, disbelief, and a brewing sense of injustice. With the ink barely dry on the Constitution, our whiskey farmers found themselves in a deja vu of taxation turmoil. Think back to the Boston Tea Party, when American colonists dumped tea into the harbor to protest British taxation. This time, the stage was set not with tea but with whiskey, and the oppressor was their own government. The whiskey tax, in the eyes of many, echoed the tea acts injustice, stirring memories of colonial resistance against British rule. But now, it was a homemade tyranny. I invite you to watch our episode about the Boston Tea Party, a financial trigger that set the stage for saying goodbye to the British. Goodbye. It's a must watch so I will make sure to direct you at the end of this video. Back to our story, protests began to simmer across the farmlands. The very idea of federal tax collectors roaming through their fields was as welcome as a fox in a hen house. These weren't the organized flyer distributing protests of urban areas, this was raw, rural discontent. Tax collectors were met not with reasoned debate but with the end of a rifle, or worse, tar and feathers. For these farmers, the whiskey tax was a betrayal, a breaking of the promise of American independence. They had fought against external tyranny only to face what they saw as internal oppression. Hamilton and Washington watched with growing concern. For them, the whiskey tax was a necessary evil, a means to dig the nation out of debt. But to the farmers, it was a symbol of overreach, a threat to their liberty and livelihood. The echoes of the Boston Tea Party rang loud and clear. As tensions mounted, the federal government found itself at a crossroads. Could they afford to back down and lose vital revenue? Or would they enforce the tax and risk igniting a full-blown rebellion? The whispers of discontent were growing louder, the flames of rebellion were being fanned, and the stage was set for a confrontation that would test the very foundations of the young republic. As the Whiskey Rebellion simmered, a defining incident threw fuel on the fire, compelling President Washington to take unprecedented action. John Neville, a tax collector, one of Hamilton's men, was tasked with collecting the controversial whiskey tax. Neville, doing his duty, found himself in western Pennsylvania, a significant hub of the Whiskey Rebellion. Here, he was met not with grudging compliance, but with outright hostility. In a particularly heated encounter, a group of rebels decided to give him a taste of justice. Neville was tarred, feathered, and marched around as a symbol of resistance. This humiliating spectacle was more than just a personal affront to Neville, it was a direct challenge to federal authority. Word of Neville's treatment reached Washington and Hamilton. For Washington, this was no longer a distant farmer's squabble, it was a direct affront to the rule of law and the authority of the federal government. 
The message was clear, the whiskey tax, and by extension, federal authority, was being openly defied. Washington, always a man of action, saw no other choice but to respond with force. In his eyes, the fledgling nation's credibility was at stake. It was a matter of demonstrating that the federal government had the will and the means to enforce its laws. Reluctantly, yet resolutely, Washington decided that he himself would lead the charge. It was a decision that would make him the first and only sitting U.S. president to personally lead an army in the field. Washington donned his military uniform, a symbol of his Revolutionary War leadership, and prepared to confront the rebels. He gathered a force of about 13,000 men, a mixture of state militia and volunteers. It was an impressive show of force, intended to quell the rebellion with its mere presence. As they marched towards the rebel stronghold in western Pennsylvania, the message was unmistakable. The United States would not tolerate insurrection. It is so strange to even read these lines. I'm imagining President Trump on the USS Gerald Ford leading the army to collect pineapple taxes in Hawaii. <laughs> Washington's decision to take command was a pivotal moment in American history. It was a bold assertion of federal power, a declaration that while the government would respect the rights of its citizens, it would also uphold and enforce its laws. The Whiskey Rebellion had escalated from a local issue to a national crisis, and now it faced the full might of a determined president. When Washington's army marched into Pennsylvania, there was a strong feeling that something really bad was going to happen. But surprisingly, the rebellion immediately ceased to exist. The rebels were scattered, avoiding confrontation. Washington's army was left marching through empty fields and deserted towns. It was an anticlimax of epic proportions, but the message was clear, the federal government isn't playing games. The farmers did pay the taxes eventually, However, Hamilton's original tax plan of six cents per gallon, which is equal to $1.25 in 2023, was reduced to two cents per gallon following the rebellion. The farmers were also given more time to pay their taxes, and the government agreed to send tax collectors to their homes instead of requiring them to travel to distant collection centers. What a lovely end! In the aftermath of the rebellion, there was a mix of relief and resentment. Sure, the government flexed its muscles, but at what cost? The cost was people whispers about tyranny, overreach, and bad memories from the British oppressors that were ruling just until a few years ago. This isn't just a footnote in history, it's a full-blown chapter about federal authority, civil disobedience, and the fine line between governance and overreach. These themes become Americans just as whiskey. The Whiskey Rebellion became a defining moment for the young United States. It's not just a quirky tale about farmers and whiskey. The rebellion shapes the country's approach to law, order, federal power, and taxation. It's a testament to the teething problems of a new nation trying to balance liberty with law. And that's it for today. A story of rebellion, taxation, and a president who wasn't afraid to get his boots muddy. Such stories like the Whiskey Rebellion are making economic history much more than what you would expect. They remind us that history isn't just about dates and documents, it's about people, passions, and as always, about money. If you like it, tell your friends, and if not, tell me. I invite you to subscribe, like, and share to support the channel, and mostly to comment with your thoughts, ideas, fact corrections, and any other economic history event that you'd like me to explore together with you. Economic Rhapsody. Thank you for watching. Talk to you soon.